All right, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It has been called the crown and climax of Pauline theology. The sublimest communication ever made to man. The consummate and most comprehensive statement which even the New Testament contains of the meaning of the Christian religion. The divinest composition of man, another person said. Marvelously concise, yet a comprehensive summary of the Christian good news and its implications. Nobody can read it without being moved to wonder and worship. It is with joy that I begin with you one of the most beloved books contained in the entire Bible. I want to let you know from the onset that I plan to take this slow. When we did Revelation, we were covering one chapter every week or every other week. We're going to go much slower than that because I really want to dig in to the profound truths that are contained in this short six-chapter epistle. If you're looking for a division of the book, it's very simple. It's custom with many of Paul's writings that we have in the New Testament that he begins with doctrine and he finishes with practical application of that doctrine. So chapter 1 through 3 are theology, doctrine. Chapters 4 through 6 are the application of that doctrine. In other words, what we're saying here is that God expects from all of us righteous living. But all righteous living must be based upon and grounded in true doctrine. Or we could put it this way. Understanding theology is important. But as for some Christians, all they want to do is delight in their understanding of theology and not the duty of obeying that theology. If we just delight without the duty, the delight is meaningless. If you're looking for a simple outline, one that's simple and easy to remember that many people throughout the ages have used for Ephesians, chapter 1 through 3 is sit. We could say sitting with Christ. Chapter 4 through 5 are, or is walk, walking in Christ. And chapter 6 is stand, standing for Christ. Sit, walk, stand. You can see in verse 1, that the letter is addressed to the saints who are in Ephesus. Or we could say to the people in Ephesus who are known as Ephesians. That's how we get the word Ephesians. It was addressed to the people in this city named Ephesus. Ephesus was a very strategic city. It was located on the port. It had a nice port on the Aegean Sea. It also had the major highway, the the east-west highway, that passed through Ephesus. It was in western Turkey, excuse me, Asia Minor, or we could say today, western Turkey. It was known back in its day, according to the book of Acts, for being the guardian of the great temple Artemis. Pagan worship, Greek gods. Also, it's known for, which is still standing today, an open-air stadium that seated 25,000 people. Paul had a very storied relationship with this church in Ephesus. It's documented throughout Scripture, completely in the book of Acts. How did, how did his relationship begin? Well, we know that on his second missionary journey, he did, in a sense, four journeys. On his second journey, he stops off in Ephesus for a very short time. They beg him to stay longer, but he's in a hurry to return to Jerusalem and get back to Jerusalem before the Passover, and he leaves behind Prisca or Priscilla and Aquila. But he says, I'll be back. And indeed, he did come back, because in that third missionary journey, he goes to Ephesus, and how long does he stay this time? About three years. So he was well connected with this church. If you're looking for dates, we're talking A.D. 54 to A.D. 57. He gets to Ephesus. The first thing he does, as he always does, is he goes to the synagogue. He starts to reason with the Jews. After a while, as it always happens, they boot him out. They don't want him there. They don't want to hear about Jesus. He goes to a rented lecture hall named the School of Tyrannus. And he preaches there for an additional two more years. When he's in Ephesus, the big controversy was with a guy named Demetrius the silversmith. 
stirs up his fellow workers. These guys are making little idols of Artemis, and Paul's basically saying there is no such thing as what you're doing. That's a false god. They didn't like it. That wasn't good for business. They provoke a riot, and Paul is forced to leave on that third missionary journey up kind of northwest into the areas of Macedonia, into Greece. He retraces his step on that journey, and he comes back to Ephesus. But he's not going to go to Ephesus because he's in a hurry to get back. And you know what it's like? Long goodbyes. It's going to take forever. He was there three years. He built some strong relationships. He can't stop off. He's in a rush. So he basically tells the church, I can't go to Ephesus, but I want to meet with your elders. So send them to the northern town named Miletus. And we're going to hang out. I'm going to talk to them. And then he departed. And after that third missionary journey visit, Most scholars believe it's questionable if Paul ever returned to Ephesus again. As I mentioned, you can see in verse 1 that the letter is addressed to the saints who are in Ephesus. After all I just said about Ephesus, I now want to tell you that I don't believe that that is the case. I agree with many other people that potentially the word Ephesus should not be in your Bible. Now you're saying, hold on a second, you've taken words out of the Bible? I've never heard you say that. Well, yeah, you have. I've told you in the past that the Bible you hold in your hand, this is not to take away confidence, but add confidence, is 99% accurate. There are potential, potential textual variants. Nothing that's going to throw you off doctrinally. Little, t- little tiny, tiny, tiny things. Like the 16th chapter of Mark, for example. And in... Most Bibles, there's little footnotes by those things that says, we're not sure about this. And the reason being is when we read our Bibles, we are not reading the actual letter or, or, or a copy of the actual letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians. That letter is lost. We don't have that anymore. So every book in the Bible we have is based upon archaeological evidence. Multiple copies that attest to Scripture better than any source that you have read, that you studied in high school and college that is old or even not as old as it has the Bible. Many of these manuscripts date back almost to the original, what we call autographs themselves. And it's questionable as to whether or not just simply that word Ephesus should be in there. If your Bible's like mine, you got a little footnote there. And the footnote is an annotation that says, three early manuscripts do not contain at Ephesus. I believe what this was, was what we call a circular letter. It was a general letter. Paul wanted to write a general letter to the churches in Asia Minor. Now you say, why does it say in Ephesus in many of our Bible copies today? Because two reasons. One, it could be that this was the first church that the letter was sent to. The other reason could be, and many people advocate this, is that it was left blank by Paul intentionally. And when copies were made of this letter and it was given to scribes, they'd copy it, and it was transferred to all those different big churches in Asia Minor, that specific scribe was expected to add in the letter specifically to that church that it was designated for. The reason it's kind of fishy that Ephesus even is even in there, and I'll move on from this uh, tangential thought in a moment here, is simply because Paul was with this church for three years. And it doesn't appear like he even knew them when you read Ephesus. It's very general. When Paul wrote to the Philippians, he dealt with specific situations. I plea with you, Odia and Syntyche, to live in harmony with the Lord. He, he, he mentions people. When he wrote to the Romans, a church he really didn't even know, he mentioned at least 26 people by name. In Ephesus, he doesn't do that. There's no indication in Ephesus that Paul even kind of knew these people. Again, after being there for three years. So unlike the letters that he wrote to different places. Corinth, Corinthians, so specific. Galatians, so specific. Of being familiar with the church. Colossians, so specific. He spent more time in Ephesus than any other place. And he speaks in a very general way. It's a general letter, I believe. Addressed to all those churches. If you're looking for a theme... We could say a theme of this letter would be Jesus is the supreme head of his church. That's a good theme. Or the believer's responsibility to walk in light of his or her heavenly calling with Christ. 
or to proclaim God's sovereign plan as it relates to Christ and his world. Those are good themes. That's what this letter kind of deals with. Purpose. Clearly in chapter 2, he gets to one of his main purposes, is that all people, if I could translate it to our culture today, black and white, would live in harmony in Christ. That in the church, it would not be guy, girl. It would not be age, older, younger. It would not be different ethnics in terms of distinctions, but that we would have a microcosm of heaven where every tribe, every tongue, and every nation who love Jesus would be one. There is no excuse for racism in the church because God sees much deeper than a skin color. And that was a problem back then between the Jews and the Gentiles. Or we could say another purpose was to encourage the body of Christ to mature in him, to grow in him, to mature in him, to become more spiritual. Or another purpose is to make the church aware, and we'll get to this next week, of their tremendous position in Christ. That you've been called and elected by Jesus Christ, and you've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Realize who you are as God's eternal beloved child. And live in accordance with that. Clearly, Paul's the author. It's very Pauline in its flavor. Mentions his name in chapter 1, verse 1. He mentions his name in chapter 3, verse 1 as well. Where did he write this letter from? Prison. Chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 20. He's in jail. Which jail is he in? Most people believe it was the house arrest in Acts 28 in Rome. And while he was under house arrest in Rome, in Acts chapter 28, he wrote Ephesians, he wrote Colossians, he wrote Philippians, and he wrote Philemon. He wrote four letters. That's why we call those four letters the prison epistles. So keep that in mind when we go through this, that Paul's writing from jail simply because he was a Christian. They imprisoned him. The letter is given in chapter 6. It says, verse 21 and 22, to a man named Tychicus. And Tychicus' job is to deliver this letter to the churches. So there's your introduction. But with the remaining time, I want to take you through verses 1 and 2, the prologue. The prologue is very typical of a modern Greek greeting of its day. Paul made a couple of modifications, but for the most part, a common letter of the day would be starting off in the same format that Paul just used. But instead of just explaining, this is where a lot of pastors probably would go, just explaining what Ephesus and Paul and all the other terms that are used there, grace and peace and everything, I want to take it from a thematic approach. Because when I was studying these two verses this week, something just jumped off the pages at me. And that is the word holiness. And I believe that's on Paul's heart. Because you can have your eyes look down to verse 4 of chapter 1, and Paul says that God's purpose in choosing us to salvation is that we would be holy and blameless before him. That's why you're saved. Not just to get to heaven. It's that we'd be holy. God's goal for you, first and foremost, is to be holy. What does that mean? To pursue righteous living to be obedient to Christ, to be conformed to the image of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in you for one purpose primarily, and that is to make you holy. So let's see what God's word this morning has to say with the time we have remaining in Ephesians 1, verses 1 to 2. Call this short sermon at this point, Save to be holy. Three points, here we go. Number one, God's Servants. Look at verse 1. Paul calls himself an apostle of Christ Jesus. When Paul called himself an apostle, he was equating himself. This is a bold statement for him to make. He was putting himself on the same level as the original 12 apostles, or we could say the 12 disciples. 
He says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, that these 12 apostles are the foundation of the church, Christ himself being the cornerstone. They played a very, very significant role. They were directly commissioned by God himself, as it says in verse 1, by the will of God. He's an apostle, they're an apostle, by the will of God to be the teachers and the final writers of God's word to his people. They wrote Holy Scripture. So you have the 12. Judas is gone. We replaced Judas with Matthias. We're back to 12 again. And we got Paul. Paul called himself one that is untimely born. 13 apostles. Now, the apostles in that formal sense, as I call capital A apostles, are no more. That office is done. There will never be a 14th apostle. But now... In the place of the apostles, who are the original teachers of God's word, stands another office, not to write new revelation, but to take the revelation that they have written, receive that revelation, and are responsible to explain it and pass it on to others. And Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, when he says he gave to the church pastors and teachers. Pastors and teachers are a gift that God has given the church. For what reason? Well, he tells us for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. The pursuit of holiness, brothers and sisters, is a very serious pursuit. And it's a challenging one. If you take it seriously, you know. It's a challenging one. And while it is your responsibility to pursue holiness, young people, listen to that. It is ultimately your responsibility to be in charge and and own your faith and pursue holiness. God has never designed it in such a way that you have to completely go it alone. He has given to the church people called apostles that wrote the Bible so we can know how to do it. Apart from this, we wouldn't know what to pursue. But he's also given the church pastors and teachers who are to proclaim this Bible, to preach this Bible, to teach the Word of God to the church, to hold you accountable to this Bible, to in love correct you when you refuse to follow this Bible, to be a good example of this Bible, to protect you from people that would hurt you from following this Bible. That is the job of the pastor of the church. And if I can speak for all the pastors now, listen to this. It is our greatest encouragement Let that sink in. Our greatest encouragement when you pursue holiness. There is nothing that makes us happier. There's nothing that makes us want to keep persevering through a very, very difficult calling. Nothing. So all those things that you're doing or you think you're doing that are just like making us real happy, I'm sure a lot of them are really good. But the greatest thing we want to see from you is you being on fire for Christ and wanting to be more like him. I talked to my wife the other day and I said, I said, I really struggle sometimes using illustrations in my sermons. Because quite often when I get done teaching about something and I use an illustration about something that happened to our family, the majority of the church want to talk about what happened to my family and not the word of God. And that's okay. I know you have a good heart and you're just trying to be kind and friendly. So I'm not trying to come down hard on you regarding that. But what I want to talk about is Scripture more than anything else. The purpose of the illustration is not to tell you a good story. The purpose of the illustration is to point to something to make the Bible more understandable. Let's talk about that ultimately. And then we'll talk about the silly stories. See? We want you coming out. Hearing God's word. Applying what you hear. Having your life show more spiritual fruit. 
We want you open to counseling and correction. We want your heart humble and teachable. We want you to put Christ first in everything, whereby Jesus will shape your entire worldview. We want that for you. We want that for ourselves. That is what Christ wants for us. That's holiness. And that is our primary job to serve you in that area. That is our responsibility. That is our joy to serve you in that. That is why we are in the ministry. Apart from that, I have no desire, if I can be very blunt with you, to be here. I'll be here as one of you. But not to be a pastor. I mean, I am fine, folks. I don't want you to misunderstand me on this. I am fine writing your letters of recommendation for your new job. I am fine filling out the applications for your children that want to go to college and need something from a pastor. I am fine going to your birthday parties. I am fine praying for your surgery. I'm fine going to the funerals of loved ones that you lose to be there to encourage you. I'm fine with the good times that we have together when we talk about sports. I'm fine with playing volleyball together. I'm fine with all that. That's all wonderful stuff. But that is not my primary purpose for being here. It's not to just be your buddy that's going to come over and hang out and watch TV with you. That's fine. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that is not my role. Don't place that upon me to be that person. My job is to help you grow in Christ-likeness. That is my job. That's what I signed up for. Because that's God's primary goal for you. And we're going to see as we read through Scripture that become very clear. And therefore, that's my primary goal too. So when you're in the hospital, I don't want to talk about the Yankees. I don't even like the Yankees. I don't hate the Yankees as some other people in this church do, but I don't. I want to talk about the Bible that should be sitting next to your bed that you've been reading and what you've been learning through this trial, that's what I really want to talk about. I didn't come to just be your buddy. I came to be your pastor. Second element that God speaks of your holiness is found in verse 1 when Paul refers to those he's writing to as saints. Do you see that there? Now that word might throw you off a little bit. Because for many people... When you think of a saint, you think of a very devout religious person from the past. As a matter of fact, I just read today that Mother Teresa was acknowledged by the Pope as a saint, right? Just today this happened. She wasn't a saint, and the Pope now today made her a saint. Are you a saint? You are? You think very highly of yourself, don't you? You're not aware of all of your shortcomings? I certainly don't act like a saint. It almost sounds rather arrogant. From now on, I want you to refer to me as Saint Randy, okay? How's that sound? (laughs) Address me from now on as Saint, not Pastor, Saint, I want to be Saint Randy. If someone's visiting, they'd be like, that's, you're, 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 you're full of yourself, man. You're kidding me? What we need to do, folks, is when we get to the Word of God, we got to always get rid of our presuppositions, our lenses that see things through the cultural connotations of the world that has imposed upon these biblical terms, and just study the, the Bible alone and, and, and see how that word alone is used according to Scripture, not even the churches of the years, but the Scriptures themselves. And when Paul addresses this letter to saints, he wasn't intending, I think it stands to reason, for only a few select people to read it. To the saints in Ephesus. So basically, the majority of you guys, once you leave the room right now, we got two people here in the front row, they're good. That's it, everybody go, just for those two saints that we have in the church. When he went to the saints in Ephesus... Who's he writing to? Everybody. Let me be clear. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are a saint. Let me explain that. Greek word, hagias. It just simply means holy one. That's what it means, holy one. You are a 
holy one. So are you a holy one? Now, you got to look at it two perspectives. One is position, one is practice. First, practice. In practice, I hope you can say yes. Not in perfection, but I hope you can say, yeah, I want to be holy. I want to live righteously, and I've been making choices by God's grace and pursuing more holiness as I move along my life. Yeah, I am, I am holy compared to the world. I'm holy. Yeah, I want that. And I'm different than all the unbelievers in what I do and what I listen to and where I go and how I process situations and how I resolve conflict. But that's not what this is really getting at here. It's getting more at your position. You see, thanks to the work of Christ, when Jesus went to the cross at Calvary, he took all of your sin upon himself. He died for every single one of your sins, past, present, and future, and proclaimed that victory through his resurrection when you received Christ on the basis of faith alone. As Paul says at the end of verse 1, the faithful who are in Christ Jesus, the ones who have faith in Christ Jesus, we could translate that, the debt against you because of your sin was entirely removed. Justice is accomplished at the cross. Jesus pays the penalty for all of your sins. Justice is done. Wrath is removed. And Christ simply did not take your sin upon himself, but a great exchange transpired at Calvary, whereby his righteousness was given to you. That's where the theology is important. You've got to get that. Give your life to Christ. Your sin goes to him. His righteousness goes to you. In a positional sense. In the eyes of God, let me be clear, you are as righteous as Jesus Christ. Because you are identified with Christ, when he sees you, he sees Jesus. And that's the only reason, folks, heaven is waiting for us. Not because we're good enough to go there. There's no sin in heaven. None of us are good enough to go there. We're only going to heaven to a place of perfectness, perfection because his righteousness has been given or the theological word is imputed or reckoned to us as a gift of his grace. You have been declared by God perfectly righteous or perfectly holy. You are saints if you're in Christ Jesus this morning. So here's what I'm getting at now. What does that positional sense mean for my practical sense, my day-to-day living out the holiness? Well, if my new identity in Christ is perfectly holy, if God has accepted me and sees me as righteous as Christ, if I've been declared holy because of a foreign righteousness given to me, it only stands to reason that I will forever on this end in my practical life grow in light of my new nature. Right? We still sin. But in the eyes of God, we are not sinners. In the eyes of God, we are saints. We are saints that still sin. And one day the presence of sin will be removed entirely. But until that day arrives, we are in the process of sanctification. Another big theological word for you. Being conformed more every day to be like Jesus. You get saved positionally. The very split second you're saved, you're as righteous as Christ. Instant heaven if you die. Most of us don't die the day we give our lives to Christ. We got 50 years on this end. And throughout those 50 years, we're becoming more and more and more and more and more like Jesus. Now, I can't have time to go into all the reasons to pursue holiness, but I think it's fair to say this, that the greatest evidence that we are truly transformed as saints will be our desire to live as saints. Your love and your respect for Jesus will be seen, if you really love him and respect him, will be seen in your desire to be like him. Last one. One more indication of God's desire for you to be holy found in the prologue, verse two. Paul says this, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse two. I want to focus on just one word in there. And the word is grace. 
If I gave you a piece of paper and a pencil and I had you write it down and I collected your answers, how would you define the word grace? It's all over the New Testament. All of you have heard of that word before. It's even the name of the church. How would you define grace? Is it just something you say before dinner? I hope you got a definition. It's one of the most beloved Christian words that we can put on our lips. Grace. What is it? I think for most of you, the definition would go along these lines. The undeserved gift of salvation that God has freely given me in Christ. Right? It's a pretty good definition. The undeserved gift of salvation that God has freely given me in Christ. That's a good definition. The undeserved gift of salvation that God has freely given me in Christ. Good definition, but too limited. Too limited. This is where many people in the modern church miss this. Because if grace is something we only get at salvation, give my life to Christ, I get grace. I receive Christ on the basis of grace. Why would Paul, in verse 2 here, write to people that have already received God's grace as if they need grace? Grace to you in peace. What do I need grace for? I'm already saved, Paul. We get some help from one of Paul's other letters that he wrote to a young man named Titus. For the grace of God has appeared, Paul says. Oh, why? Bringing salvation to all men. Oh, there it is. Grace is what saves us. We're not saved by our works. We're saved by grace. We know that. Oh, but it goes on. Instructing us. Oh, grace is teaching us now? Teaching us what? To deny ungodliness and deny worldly desires and to live sensibly. Here it is, righteously. There it is, there's holy. Grace has come to teach you to live holy and godly in this present age. Grace is not here just some passive thing we accept. That's where people go. I keep sinning, and God keeps giving me more grace. I love this Christian thing. I get to go home when I die. I still get to sin as much as I want. Grace just keeps flooding me. This is a great setup. No, grace has come not just to save you and continually forgive every time you sin, which in in a sense is true. Grace is there to help you not sin anymore. It's not a passive thing. It's an active power in your life to live righteously. If you are not pursuing holiness, if I can put it very straight with you here, you do not know grace. You don't have grace. And if you aren't pursuing holiness and being made more holy, you must, along with your own effort, cooperate with God's strength that he supplies in his grace. You're not going to get holy based upon your own effort. You get holy based upon you cooperating with God's power, which makes you more like Christ. Paul goes on to say in Titus that Jesus gave himself for us to purify for himself a people for his own possession. That's why grace came. That's the purpose that Christ wants for you. So to put it all together, pastors give themselves to the church for the primary purpose that you might be holy. Christ gave himself for you that you might be holy. And since God has already declared that you are holy, calling you a saint, use the means that he has provided for you to help you become more aligned with your new identity in Christ. Holiness. He's given you Christ. He's given you pastors. He's given you the Holy Spirit. He's given you the word of God, all for the purpose of you becoming more holy in your conduct. Now, we got communion set for us here. And Paul said in Corinthians that before we partake of these elements, we should examine ourselves. I want us to make sure we really know Jesus. 
Because if we're partaking of these elements and we don't know Christ, we're making a mockery of them. And Paul says it's better that you just let them pass by. So if you, if you don't know Jesus, don't eat and drink because the Bible says you eat and drink judgment to yourself. You can give your life to Christ right now, change all that. You can acknowledge the fact that you're a sinner and that you need forgiveness and understand that Christ paid for all of your sins on the cross and give your life to him simply by believing upon him and be saved today. Do that right where you're at. You don't need to come up. If you do that, you need to partake. Because this is not about working your way up to this table. It's about grace. You're as holy in God's eyes as the guy who's been pursuing Christ for 40 years in this church. But it's also a time to examine ourselves to make sure that we are living without sin. And if we're aware of sin, now is the time to make some to do some business with God and say, Lord, I'm going to partake, but I admit I have sin and I need to go home and make some, make some steps to change this. If you have no, listen, if you have no desire to repent of your sin, don't partake. This table is for sinners. Saints that still sin, but repentant sinners. So let's do a little examination. Are you asking God to show you sin in your life? Are you aware of any sin that he has pointed out to you? Are you, by God's grace, making that effort to repent and turn from that sin? Let's get more specific. Are there any relationships in your life that are unreconciled? And you've not made any efforts to try to make it right, especially with another believer. That's sin. Do you need to apologize to somebody? Maybe you need to forgive somebody, and you're just holding out a grudge against that person. That's sin, folks. If you have no desire to repent from that, don't partake. You got anger in your heart? Bitterness in your heart? You need to repent before you partake. Is there greed in your heart? Coveting in your heart? Materialism in your heart? Do you have anything that does not belong to you? That's stealing. How's your thought life? Is it pure? What kind of images are you viewing on the television, in movies, on the computer screen? Are you using your spiritual gifts to build up the body of Christ in the church? Are you faithfully attending church? Do you have any addictions? I'm not talking just chemicals. Do you have any addictions that are now number one in your life over the place that Christ deserves because you dwell on that more than you dwell on Jesus? Something you just got to have? How's your marriage? Men, you loving your wife as Christ loved the church? Women, are you honoring your husband? We'll get to that in Ephesians 5. How's your parenting? Are you discipling your kids? Disciplining your kids, teaching your kids, loving your kids, spending time with your kids, setting a good example of Christ for your kids. You speaking the truth. You're demonstrating love toward other people. Do you use wholesome words? Do you encourage other people in their faith? These are commands. Are you sharing your faith with other people? Do you want to be made more holy? How do you feel when other people call you out on your sin? Are you thankful? Or do you play the don't judge me game? Are you humble? Are you being made more holy? Are you being made more like Christ? Do you love him? If you love me, 
You'll do what I say, Jesus said. He gave himself, brothers and sisters, to purify a people for himself. To purify a people for himself. Are we those people individually and are we that church corporately? Let's just bow our heads, pray, and I'll let the Lord work on your heart and my heart. Dear Lord, this is nothing where we are looking at where the church has fallen short. This is nothing where we're looking at where our neighbor has fallen short. This is something we need to do continually to ask you where we are falling short. Maybe something was just brought out to us in that list that I read and we could have got more exhaustive on the things that we are doing that we shouldn't do and the things we're not doing that we should be doing. And it touched the nerve. That's a good thing. I believe, Lord, when a man becomes angry over the acknowledgement of his sin, that's an indication that he's really stuck in that sin. And his heart is hard. We want soft hearts, Lord. We want to turn from our sin because we have been set apart for you. We've been declared saints. We've been given grace that says we no longer have to be a slave to the very things that would have sent us to hell. We can be free. We have the power. Your grace is sufficient for us. Help us, Lord, to overcome our sin. Help us to hate our sin. Help us to love righteousness and holiness. Is there anything in our lives, Lord, reveal it to us individually now where we are falling short? Not according to a man-made definition of what is right and what is wrong, but according to Scripture. And you acknowledge it. Confess it to you. Own up to it. Take responsibility for it. And then ask you by the power that you supply that works mightily within us, Paul said in Philippians, to turn from it. How much happier we will be much more glorified in our life you will be. How much more our, our, our spouses and our children will respect us. Christian faith is a faith of humility. Humility that says we have not arrived. Blessed, Jesus said, are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. As we partake of these elements, help us to be reminded of your grace, your holiness that was willing to take our stained and filthy sin upon yourself because you love us so much and be forsaken by your Father because you love us so much to declare us and to make us pure. May you minister to our hearts, Lord, at this time. In Christ's name, amen.